Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. We're continuing our celebration of the Terminal World set with the very first antagonists of the series, as long as you don't factor in any prequel Ice Barrier Dragon shenanigans. They're often derided as one of the least effective, floundering decks ever printed, which is outrageous when you think about how they almost brought the entire world of Terminus to its knees. Premiering in the November 2009 side set, Hidden Arsenal 1, worms are invaders from beyond the stars who seek to consume everything they can and convert whatever's left over to suit their needs. They're also adept at using their rapid mutations to their advantage, molding themselves to suit whatever threat is thrown their way, making them a constant, evolving threat to the alliance of tribes known as Justice. After a long-fought war, with help from many allies and a bit of luck, our heroes were able to just barely defeat the colossal Worm Zero. But peace wasn't so easily earned, something you can learn more about from the living lore of Dual Terminal videos. In paper, on the other hand, worms suck! The designers have taken several cracks at making flip archetypes good and have had a few success stories over the years. But worms are very much a stepping stone on their journey to improve the mechanic, rather than a culmination of lessons learned. This does give them a hint of danger, acting as deadly ambush predators with powers you won't know about until you fall victim to them, but they'd actually have to print effects worth a damn for the fear to actually take hold. But are there any actual redeeming qualities to these slimy saboteurs? Well, that's what we're here to figure out today. We'll analyze some grotesque samples, see what the hive mind has in store, then find some hidden secrets that might help in the invasion. It's time to worm our way into everyone's hearts with worms... Explained. Today's episode is brought to you by my lovely patrons, as well as the wonderful people over at Dragon Shield. Get the sleeves as strong as dragon scales and save 5% on your order by using coupon code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. So, what's the deal with worms? Well, they're a series of light attribute reptile type monsters that have a big focus on the flip mechanic. Well, the ones we'll be talking about today are like that. There are actually several worm monsters that are not light reptiles that aren't meant to be included in our theme, but usually our type and attribute will keep us distinct from the rest of the worm rabble. As for what the deck does, well, lots of things. Like most early dual terminal themes, they don't really have a coherent game plan, they just throw everything at the wall to see what sticks, so don't expect too much from them. There's a reason they catch so much flack, after all. Oh, and quick format change here, normally I cover monsters in level order, but a funny quirk about worms is that there's 26 of them, and they have a name for each letter of the English alphabet. So for this one, I've been compelled by forces beyond myself to cover them in alphabetical order this time around. First up is Worm Apocalypse, a level 1 flip monster with 300 attack and 200 defense, making this a Karibo card. And its effect targets a spell or trap card on the field and destroys it. Watch out! It is mandatory. So if you have any and your opponent has none, get ready for the repercussions. It's not the worst thing in the world to have some back row removal, but please, Apocalypse? I think the Space Noodles are trying to overcompensate for being the universe's most basic looking stickman drawing. Worm Barces is a level 3 monster with 1400 attack and 1500 defense, and when normal summoned, you can target a defense position monster and change it to face up attack position. This is actually one of the more clever pieces of design we have on hand, because it can be used as a stop defense on your opponent's monsters, but it's far more useful as a way to flip up a worm that's either stuck in face down defense position, or was special summoned face down that turn and needs a little help. Honestly, it's the job it was made for. Look at all those hands! This fella could flip four days. Worm Carteros is a level 4 flip monster with 1200 attack and 500 defense, and if flipped, you can add a level 4 or lower reptile type worm monster from your deck to your hand. Shame that it doesn't help you search out your higher order worms, but we shan't look a gift horse in the mouth. It's weird, strange, vertical mouth. The theme is already in a bad way, so getting picky about search effects seems a little crass. Besides, this one already looks pissed enough for the both of us. Looks like it's already starting the evil revenge monologue portion of the invasion. Worm Dimocles is a level 4 flip monster with 1700 attack and 1400 defense, and if this card is flipped, it gains 300 attack and defense, putting it at 2000 attack and 1700 defense. Not the worst, it's got a decent enough normal lineup, and if it survives the flip, it's a little beefy, but not beefy enough to justify the weight. In fact, I'd be surprised if any of this was made of beef at all. Much more of a gelatin-based life form, I think. 
Warm Arakin is a level 6 monster with 2400 attack and 1200 defense that cannot be special summoned. Once per turn, you can select a face up reptile type worm monster on the field and change it to face down defense position. This is actually a pretty useful effect, getting you more value out of your worms by getting their flip effects multiple times. Might even help to leave them in defense position where their low stats aren't going to get your life points roasted. But it's so funny to see that they thought this effect was so good, so valuable, that they had to put a no special summon restriction on this card when other archetypes would just let their monsters do this by themselves. Heck, not even later, Pac-Man was doing this for crying out loud. I'm telling you, worms are a disgrace to the noob munching camels. Worm Falco is a level 2 flip monster with 500 attack and 800 defense, and when it flips, you change all face-up reptile type worm monsters you control to face down defense position except this card. Like Arakin, this helps to reset our worms to get more value out of them, and is potentially a lot easier to resolve than the big bungler. What gets me is, this isn't the only Falco in Dual Terminal. Gustos have one too, but their themes have never actually met. What's going on here? Worm Ghouls is a level 4 monster with 1500 attack and 300 defense, and each time a face down defense position monster is flipped face up, place a worm counter on this card. And this card gains 300 attack for each worm counter on it. Okay, as far as effects go, this isn't half bad. It rewards us for doing what we want to be doing with a monster that can actually stand on its own. Flip two worms, and this is at Cyber Dragon power. Flip two more, and this thing starts actually threatening real monsters. And this counts your opponent's monsters too, which means Book of Moon doesn't only stop your enemy, it bolsters you as well. Now, for the love of God, go get a tissue, you're covered in mucus! Worm Hope is a level 1 flip monster with 800 attack and 1500 defense, and when this card is flipped face up by an opponent's monster attack, draw a card. And when this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, send a card from your hand to the grave. So it cycles you a card, but only if your opponent attacks over it. Otherwise, you just discard a card. That's... That's... That's incredible how bad this card is. Holy cow. I mean, there is a world where it gets flipped over and doesn't get destroyed in battle. Then you could return it to the hand or flip it back face down, but I'd like to ask how in the heck you're supposed to enable that on a body this small? This card's name is right. What did they hope to accomplish with this? Worm Illidan is a level 5 monster with 2000 attack and 1800 defense, and each time a card is set on your side of the field, place a worm counter on this card. And you can remove two worm counters from this card to select a card your opponent controls and destroy it. Now, I was looking some stuff up for this video, and one trivia article poster posits that Worm Hope is the younger version of Illidan. And I can see what they mean. While it's at a different angle, they are posed the same, and even share the same chest lights. I just wish there was a better connection between the two. Like, if the effects or stats lined up in any meaningful way. The effect is good though. The more you set, the more removal you get. And hard removal, especially in this era, is hard to come by. Set a monster face down and set a spell and trap card, and that's that. Hey! Maybe there is some hope for these cards after all. Worm Jetalixby is a level 3 flip monster with 1200 attack and 0 defense, and when this card is destroyed and sent to the grave the turn it's flipped, special summon it from the grave in defense position. This essentially makes it a double blocker, though if you do have a quick effect that can flip this face down before it gets attacked again, you could get another summon out of it. There's also the odd scenario where you flip it on your turn, crash it into something only to have it come right back, but that's a bit much, and I don't know what it really accomplishes. Honestly, a pretty bad specimen. Can't even secrete the fluid that dissolves and reshapes the environment around it like the rest of the worm, so they cover themselves in just normal mud to pass it off. Real shame. Worm King is a level 8 monster with 2700 attack and 1100 defense, and this card can be tribute summoned in phase of attack position by tributing a reptile type worm monster. You can tribute a reptile type worm monster to select a card your opponent controls and destroy it. That's right, you get to take a worm you've already used up and chuck it at a card you don't like. No bothering with trying to reset it to get more value, you just get a one for one trade. And don't worry, this isn't once per turn. So if you get bogged down by a surplus of these, then you've got a full salvo to mess up your opponent's field with. You even get to tribute summon it for a steal. How nice. Now if only they would stop letting their mouth do that worm thing, it'd be perfect. Worm Lynx is a level 2 flip monster with 300 attack and 1000 defense, and after being flipped up during the end phase if this card is face up on the field, you draw a card. Do I 
Do I even need to say anything about this? Like, at least if you could draw the card on flip during your own turn, you could then turn this monster into another one by using it as material. Even Skullangle knew that. Lynx doesn't even make for good Link material. Come on! Worm Milledith is a level 4 flip monster with 400 attack and 1600 defense, and when flipped, you can equip this card to a monster your opponent controls as an equipped card. And the controller of the equipped monster takes 400 damage during each standby phase. That's 800 points per turn cycle, which is not insignificant. The issue is that they have to keep the monster, and just about everything can be traded in for something else nowadays. Turns out copying from Brainjacker's homework wasn't the best idea. Shocker. Worm Noble is a level 6 flip monster with 1500 attack and 2400 defense, and when flipped, if done so by an opponent's attack, inflict damage to your opponent equal to half the attacking monster's attack. So, the reward for tribute setting this monster is a bad magic cylinder. Like, at least magic cylinder negates the attack. Maybe if this survived the battle, you get to deal a little extra battle damage and you get a chance to reset it, but no thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, since this looks like the worms tried to graft themselves onto a flayed mosquito corpse, I'm going to go barf now. Worm Opera is a level 2 flip monster with 400 attack and 800 defense, and if flipped, all face-up monsters on the field lose 500 attack, except reptile-type worm monsters. This is... I don't know if good is the right word, but it's certainly on point. Making our opponent's monsters weaker means they can't threaten us as easily, and gives our worms a fighting chance when it comes to surviving battle. So it's doing a nice job, but I'm gonna ruin it for you. It looks kinda derpy with a big flappy mouth, right? Seems... Pretty charming, actually, but it's fake. Look inside, and it still has the signature slitted worm mouth. Yuck! Worm Prince is a level 6 monster with 2200 attack and 400 defense, and if this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you can add a reptile-type worm monster from your deck to your hand. But destroy this card during the end phase if you don't control another reptile-type worm monster. Um... I... Uh... Okay, so you're telling me that in the deck that wants to have as many face-down monsters as possible to spring their flip effects, you have a pseudo-boss monster that will explode itself during either end phase, mind you, if you don't have another face-up worm monster. Is that it? I mean, granted, the effect is helpful, but I... This is one of our higher-order worms here. This is supposed to be one of their apex creatures. I think we should not talk about this anymore. I'm already getting a migraine. Worm Queen is a level 8 monster with 2700 attack and 1100 defense, and you can tribute summon this card in phase of attack position by tributing a reptile type worm monster. And once per turn, you can tribute a reptile type worm monster to special summon a reptile type worm monster from your deck with a level less than or equal to the tributed monsters. So you're only ever trading down or even, you're not going to be able to take a Falco and turn it into a king, sadly. But being able to swap your worms to some degree is still a nice trait to have, and still comes with that tribute summon discount so you can get this out early. Sadly though, we are missing out on potentially the best piece of art in the game, as we're about one second before Queen scarfs down that Democles like the universe's most toxic gummy bear. Mmm. Worm Rakuya is a level 4 monster with 2400 attack and 1200 defense, and it can only declare an attack the turn it was flipped face up. If this card attacked, change it to face down defense position at the end of the battle phase. So if you normal or special summon this, you've got a body that just sits there. If it gets flipped during your opponent's turn and still somehow survives, it's still just gonna be a big, immovable body. I know there's a lot of low-level monsters with high attacks and a drawback, but this one takes the cake. At least monsters like Goblin Attack Force get to attack the turn you summon them. But I should have seen this coming. The giant undefinable blob with teeth is bad at attacking. Who could have guessed? Worm Solid is a level 4 monster with 1000 attack and 1600 defense, and it gains 100 defense for each reptile type worm monster in your graveyard. And if your opponent takes battle damage from attacking this card, at the end of the damage step, select a spell or trap card your opponent controls and destroy it. So its defense can get pretty big, but it's back row removal that only works when it deals battle damage in retaliation. I don't care what the name is, this card is definitely not doing you a solid. Worm Tentacle is a level 4 monster with 1700 attack and 700 defense, and once per turn you can remove from play a reptile type worm monster in your grave to allow this card to attack twice during the same battle phase. This has... 
nothing to do with being a flip archetype, but I'm so happy to see an effect that actually gives you a way to be proactive that I don't even care. 1700 isn't even that bad of an attack stat. Slap a little boost on there and it can battle it out with the best of them. But this does mean it's probably the laziest of the worms. There's adapting to suit your environment, and then there's just straight up copying Octopi. Please, plagiarism doesn't make any of us look good. Worm Ugly is a level 1 monster with 100 attack and defense, and when you tribute summon a reptile type worm monster by tributing in this card, you can special summon this card from your graveyard to your opponent's side of the field in face up attack position. Uh. Wait. Wait, oh my god, is this. Is this honest to goodness combo support in worms? Like, okay. You can tribute this to summon Worm Prince. That gives your opponent this ball of slime, and now you have a target you can run over to get that search. Oh, I'm so happy! Uh, but that's about all there is to say about this card. There's not really a lot of things this does outside of that. Though it potentially also shuts off cards like Lightning Storm. But the name Ugly is a little much. Take an issue to the green globs there, and you've got yourself a cuddly little slime orb. I'm asking for a plush right now. Worm Victory is a level 7 flip monster with 0 attack and 2500 defense, and when flipped, destroys all face-up monsters on the field except reptile-type worm monsters. And this card gains 500 attack for each reptile-type worm monster in your grave. This is another effect that's pretty good, being a selective board wipe can deal with a lot of situations, and grows very large later in the game. What sucks is that, unlike our other high-level worms, Victory doesn't get a tribute discount, so you've either got to find a way to special summon this face down, or tribute set it with two monsters, which does not feel good. But with sufficient worms in grave, even special summoning this in attack isn't too bad. The only thing off here is this menacing, hulking invader from a hive mind species is giving several V for Victory salutes. I have no clue what's going on here, but I'm gonna go out on a limb here, or six of them, and say that Victory just blew up a whole Justice Battalion on its own with its special powers and is being a very sore winner about it. Worm Warlord is a level 6 monster with 2350 attack and 1800 defense that can't be special summoned. It negates the effects of effect monsters destroyed by battle with this card, and if this card destroys an opponent's monster by battle, it can attack once again in a row. Once again, flipping has nothing to do with this card. In fact, it's kind of an anti-worm card if you think about it. It can plow through a whole field of them and you'd never have to deal with any of the consequences. But on the other hand, this gives you a way to deal with a whole field of monsters. There's no limit to the amount of extra attacks you can get here, so as long as you make sure that Warlord is swole and beats up monsters in battle, it's got serious Bugente Susanoo potential. Heck, you even get an additional direct attack after it's all done as a reward for clearing out that field. It's just a shame you can't special summon it. It sucks that they printed a queen that was clearly meant to toolbox your monsters around and made it so two of those can't be special summoned. This theme is as poorly thought out as Warlord here is. Who thought putting the arms and legs in this configuration was at all helpful? The next two worms are ones we actually have to talk about together. Worm Zex is a level 4 monster with 1800 attack and 1000 defense, and when this card is normal summoned, you can send a reptile type worm monster from your deck to the graveyard. And if you control a face up Worm Yagan, this card can't be destroyed by battle. Oh, hey, a name drop. Worm Yagan is a level 4 monster with 1000 attack and 1800 defense, and if the only monster you control is Worm Zex, you can special summon this card from your grave in face down defense position. And if you do, remove it from play when it's removed from the field. And when this card is flipped face up, select a face up monster your opponent controls and return it to its owner's hand. So you normal summon Zex, send Yagan from deck to grave, and look, you fulfilled the requirements to summon out Yagan. From there, Yagan would be a compulse waiting to happen that would give Zex battle destruction immunity once it got flipped up. And from that point, you could overlay him for a rank 4, keeping Yagan from being banished. This little combo was so neat and compact that you'd actually see this being played in a lot of decks, especially slower ones, as a way to give you a little extra interaction when backed up with a bunch of trap cards. And in that regard, probably makes them the most competitively successful worm cards in the history of worms. So next time you hear people talking smack about X and Y, you make sure to put them in their place. Lastly, we have the theme's sole extra deck monster, Worm Zero, a level 10 fusion monster with question mark attack and zero defense, requiring two or more reptile type worm monsters as material. 
For each fusion material with a different name used to fusion summon this card, it gains 500 attack and also gains these effects. With two or more, once per turn, you can select a reptile monster in your grave and special summon it in face down defense position. With four or more, you can remove from play a reptile monster from your grave to send a monster on the field to the grave, and with six or more, once per turn, you can draw a card. This is it. The Singularity of the Worms, their most deadly form, and honestly, it's not bad. While a 2 material 0 isn't going to do much, it's still a worm revive from Grave, or honestly any reptile since this lacks that archetypal distinction. But a 6 material 1 will prove to be a real asset, because those effects are going to add up turn after turn. And don't think I didn't see them trying to subtly suggest the best card for it, Future Fusion. All the buildings pointing at a single vanishing point is a little on the nose, don't you think? But when that card was at full power, yeah, it was kind of a menace. You'd see something similar with Five God Dragon. You could send every worm in your deck to the graveyard, then you'd have a whole lot of light monsters in there to do with whatever you please. And let's just say that Worm Victory is going to be very thankful. In fact, this is the card that makes best use of Victory, because it special summons face down. If this ever, and I mean ever, gets support, I expect Worm Zero to be at the forefront of any competent list especially with all the advances we've made in Shadal Fusion style effects. But regardless, you can always say there's gonna be zero reason to play Worms. Alright, after that enormous section, let's take a small break and talk about the spells and traps. Worm Call is a continuous spell card, and once per turn, if your opponent controls a monster and you control no monsters, you can special summon a reptile-type worm monster from your hand in face-down defense position. I don't know what it was, but there were so many continuous spells like this back in the day. This one made sure to keep the most important thing, special summoning face down. This also enables worm victory because there's no level cap, but also helps you get more worms into rotation, either to give you more effects to use, or free tribute fodder for your big worms. Again with the big city though, good grief. This has more lore implications than I care to shake a stick at. Like, bonus theory, we know that Dual Terminal and World Legacy are connected because of Evita, right? But both also have these random cityscapes in them. And I always assumed that World Legacy was the sequel because of all the references. But since the World Legacy history talks about layers of Earth being added to the planet to seal away evil, if this is the same city, would that make World Legacy the prequel? You know, just food for thought. W Nebula Meteorite is a normal trap card that changes all face down monsters on the field to face up defense position. And during the end phase of that turn, change all face up light reptile type monsters you control to face down defense position, then draw a card for each. After that, you can special summon a level 7 or higher light reptile type monster from your deck. This is probably the most famous of the worm cards. Every so often, people would opine over the potential of this card and theorize what could be released that would actually make this game breaking. And there's a lot to like here. You get to trigger all of your worm effects, draw for each that make it to the end phase, then summon out one of your big bosses for free. It's actually wild. It just has to, you know, resolve. And the only deck where that's a payoff is worms, so getting this W is still a ways away. All right, so that's all the worm cards, but what do we do with them? Uh, look, can I be real with you? It's not a flip control deck. There are so many other decks better than us at that, but for some reason, we've got some really neat aggro pieces. Between big monsters like King, Queen, Warlord, and Victory, we're putting in some massive numbers. If we have good flip effects, we should obviously include them, but we're going to have to cut a lot of chaff and get help from a lot of other light reptile cards, which there are a lot more of than you might think. So what can we play to help them out? Well, right off the bat, let's go over some generic reptile support. King of the Feral Limps is a generic rank 4 that searches out any reptile from your deck, perfect for summoning off of Zex and Yagan. Snake Rain is a lovely card for filling up that grave with reptiles, which will almost exclusively be for gassing up Victory, or even Evil Dragon Ananta if you want the extra option. Though you also have the option of sending Knight Sword Serpent to help give you some free level 4 material. And you know who else likes being sent to the graveyard? The Ogdawatix! In fact, it probably gives you the best summon off of W Nebula Meteorite possible in the form of Ogdo Abyss, the Ogdawatic Overlord. Gotta love another big board wipe. Not a lot of alien cards help us per se, but Alien Shock Trooper M Frame is a nice link and could potentially flood your field with worms after it gets destroyed. And Alien Brain works well with us because, well, our monsters are going to get run over by battle anyway. Might as well steal their cards to up our card quality. 
As for the flip summoning aspect, if you are looking to expound on that, we have a lot of good options. Book of Moon is almost always a strong choice, as well as Book of Eclipse. Sure, your opponent could end up drawing a lot of cards, but you get another shot at your flip effects, so it's a win-win. Book of Taiyu can also get your flip effects online faster, with Book of Lunar Eclipse giving a lot of range and flexibility with your flip downs. But honestly, I can't think of a better way to control your flips than with Prediction Prince's Tarot Ray. Maybe even Tarot Wraith. If you can find the room for a Prediction Princess engine, that is. But the highest help isn't even going to be a book card at all. It's Junk Sleep. It flips all your monsters in response to a summon, giving you more chances to debuff stats with Opera, blow up monsters with Victory, bounce with Yagan, and because it sets all of your cards face down during the end phase, it even helps keep Worm Prince safe in a pinch. As for a silly tech pick, this one comes straight from the value tip section of Yugipedia. Chain Material. Flip this on your own turn, and you can take a grave full of worms and turn them into a gigantic zero. But what spell is best to summon this enormous orb? Well, none other than Greater Polymerization. We were going to be using at least three material anyway, so for our troubles, not only does Worm Zero gain piercing to make better use of its hopefully humongous attack stat, it also gains protection from effect destruction to help keep our investment safe. It even keeps it from being destroyed by the downside of chain material. Though if you can't go for the kill, don't use your entire grave, you want something to use with Zero's effect, right? Alright, that's everything I know about Worms, but how does it measure up against the Nova scale? Novelty. Worms are, as far as I can tell, the first dedicated flip archetype, if you don't count the good Gravekeeper monsters, and basically all the Charmers, which I don't, but it doesn't really do anything with the mechanic. It's just a bunch of slapdash effects, and a good third of our cards don't even care about flipping. So, yeah, it's arguably the first, but with Shadals and Prediction Princesses giving us a real go at it in just a few years after this was released, with nothing to tie them back to any groundwork set by Worms, I've got to give them a one in novelty. Objectivity. The one card that could have possibly given this deck a fighting chance is W Nebula Meteorite. And with a card like Transaction Rollback, this could be played as early as turn one with the right setup. But even if this does get fully utilized, I think we're long past the point where this would have been any good. And everything else here is pretty tame, so this is an easy five in objectivity from me. Versatility. With the exception of the Zex and Yagan combo, so little of Worms actually gets seen in other themes. And while there are cards that help Reptiles, even Light Reptiles specifically, it's still very sparse. So Worms are getting a 1 in versatility. Awesomeness. This might be because I have a soft spot for dual terminal lore, but I can at least see what they were going for with these. Their sporadic but unfocused effects are in response to a variety of stimuli from the numerous tribes they fight. Many of the themes rely on spell and trap cards that represent their world, and Apocalypse comes by and eats it up. Queen helps to drive their evolution to better suit their needs, and Zero is their last ditch effort, combining into one final attack to wipe out their adversaries. Even Worm Solid, with its absolute nothing of an effect, still has some value here, because it makes me think of Ally of Justice Quarantine that maybe this is the demonstration of how it's supposed to work, literally quarantining these creatures so their corrosive influence doesn't spread, even in death. And if you try to break it open without disposing of it, well, there goes that spell and trap removal again. It's bad, it's bland, it's not doing anything exciting, but I still can't help but give them a 2 in awesomeness, giving Worms a total of 9 on the Nova scale. And that's all I have to say about Worms. It's a shame there isn't really much to like about them. I mean, it's not like they can't convey that kind of stuff through the cards. Fabled very clearly showed their menace, being both strong and using the discard functionality as a way to show off how they ditch each other during their bids of power, and how some of them even thrive under those circumstances. I just wish Worms had been given a better shot. Maybe someday these mutant monsters will get their own core set treatment, or maybe even their own terminal world pack. If it can elevate Gen X, it can do anything. And no, introducing the worm type does not count as legacy support. That's a whole different word. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Do you agree that worms don't have what it takes to flip the script, or do you still love them, even though they're worms? And which one's your favorite? Like I said, worm ugly, it needs a plush. I want to squish it. Let me know your favorite down below, and if you haven't already, 
please make sure to like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Dragon Shield. Get this leaves as strong as dragon scales that also come with their own lore while saving 5% on your order. Just make sure to use code GOLDENNOVA at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including the illustrious Quasar Commanders Frankie and Marluxia as a girl, Nebula Navigators Third Dynasty, Ada Basilisk, Adam Zajdel, Andrew Newman, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Christopher Fuss, Clock's Work, Danny Bound, Dark Dragon X830, Eric, Aaron the World Breaker, Garland Chaos, Green Knight, Great Big Pillock, Hair Bear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Hydrocraft 135, Iron Zero, Iskander 711, Mana Charge, Marion James E. Picotta, Mega Combi, Millennia Asta, Molly Renata, Muziki Clark, Nathan Vig, Natiel Lee Alexander, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Sammy Haim, Sir Knight JCB, Sky Buster Leo, The Wizard Moose, URTV 667 and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders Alpha Sly, Almento 5010, A Random Pup, Ariel Kersey, Beluga Masta, Blue Gem, Borger with a Shotgun, Chaz Ghost, Corbinisms, Drakenwald, Eki Bullock, Emini, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Howling Zangetsu, Herbal D, Inblink, Jester Design, Kale the Dragon, Carp, Kivon Public, King Scarlet Yu Gi Oh, Lord Whoop De Doo, Manga Pages, Matt Simmons, Michael Shimabukuro, Mustafa Aiden, Nitromo, Psycho Reaper Gaming, Shizuki Nijimura, Sophie, apparently, Stephen Williamson, Taylor Seymour, The Legendary Raven, Tucker Ordorn, Venusian Teapot, and Zell Drekka, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to help me in my journey in covering all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s archetypes, get my videos early, be a part of these credits, and participate in monthly custom card reviews, I'd be super grateful if you'd consider checking out my Patreon in the description or joining as a YouTube member. And if you'd like to see what all the fuss is about in regards to the story, check out this playlist of videos that I've made covering the dual terminal lore. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye